so i feel we are at this very very opportune moment in computing history where computer science has gone from just like a field or like a cool field right within engineering to becoming the dominant field which is powering right so many aspects of how the world is run today Hello and welcome everyone to this particular podcast. Uh, for this particular podcast, we have with us Dr. Manish Gupta. Uh, Dr. Gupta is currently the director of Google Research in India. Prior to that, he was the vice president and led the Xerox Research Center in India, majorly working on data analytics and mobile computing projects. Before that, he was also at IBM Research in India, leading the efforts and building a lab. focused on high performance computing and business analytic projects he also worked on the ibm blue gene supercomputer project early in 2000s at the ibm tj watson research center uh, for which ibm received the national medal of technology and innovation from the president of the united states he also led the efforts at the goldman sachs developing uh, technologies related to cloud databases and networking aiding business functions He also co-founded and was the CEO of an educational technology startup called VideoCan. He has received multiple distinguished awards for his efforts and contributions, and has co-authored a lot of academic papers in the domains of computer science. And he has a long, uh, long history of being an entrepreneur, a uh, leader, and also now a director uh, at the Google Research in India. So, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Gupta, for joining this for this particular podcast, and I, I really look forward to this conversation. Thanks, Jay, for having me. Uh, very happy to join. <clears throat> so, so in order to learn more about, like, what what kind of projects are you currently heading at the Google Research in India, and what does your work routine as a director look like, so that people can understand uh, what kind of interests you have currently? Sure. So, I mean, um, <clears throat> at Google Research, I mean, um, uh, like any part of research, uh, often our work spans. different kinds of areas right right from um working on foundational research uh, to <clears throat> research that apply to existing google products as well as creating new products uh, and also the research that's not tied to any google product where we are looking to primarily impact lives through the work that we do so <clears throat> so i would say um, even for google research india uh, we are covering the gamut of those uh in some sense uh, different paths uh so we do have teams uh, pursuing foundational research in areas like uh, deep learning better understanding of deep learning models why they work uh, <clears throat> and how to make them more robust uh, how to make them <clears throat> uh, also support some of those ai principles like data privacy and so on uh, more effectively uh, to teams working on also things like understanding how humans human brain works how humans make decisions uh, can we uh, kind of take inspiration from how humans think to building more effective machine learning models to uh, kind of work that is very driven by where we can impact the world through google products and there i would say i mean one key example would be our work on democratizing access to information in indian languages so we all kind of all of us right who kind of understand english uh, i feel we are uh, i mean in a country like india we are amongst the privileged lots because to us information there is a lot of information at our fingertips uh, we literally need to simply just whatever type up a query in our favorite search engine and there's a whole lot of information that we can access but how do we democratize that kind of an access right to somebody uh, let's say a uh, farmer son in haryana or that laborer's daughter in chatisgarh so that they have also access to similar kinds of information when they query in their native language uh, so that's kind of one key area uh, and then we also look a lot at uh, in some sense what are some of the challenges that india is facing as a country um in particular we see again agriculture being a key sector which employs like close to half of india's uh, population is dependent on agriculture for as a means of livelihood so how can we apply again develop and apply technology 
to transform agriculture? Uh, how do we, uh, again, uh, healthcare has become also, a, I mean, <clears throat> a very important area. I feel it's, it's in a way like almost like a, a system crying for a transformation all over the world. Uh, I don't think any country in the world is happy with this healthcare system. So how can we again apply AI to transform health? So those are, <clears throat> again, some of the areas. Uh, and then, of course, I think in one of your earlier podcasts, I think you had uh, my colleague Milan Tambe, uh, who yeah. probably talked about our work on AI for social good, where we are not driven by any Google product, but working with various nonprofits uh, who are making a difference to their communities and working on AI problems, right, that are inspired by the challenges that these nonprofits face in their work. Uh, so. So that's kind of a very quick summary of the kind of things we are doing at the lab. Yeah. Yeah, no, I really love that because from what I'm hearing, it's it's more like uh, application oriented. So you have a particular set of uh, applications that you want to solve and then whatever needs to be done from a research standpoint, you are trying to build that particular foundation based on research so that we can specifically target those applications or use case scenarios and 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 in, in terms of understanding your thought process so before that i if, if correct me if i'm wrong like you were at the uh, xerox research center in india prior to joining these uh, the this google lab what was your thought process behind joining this like why did you decide to lead this particular uh, lab and what what can you tell us about the challenges as in because i think uh, in few of the interviews, you have talked about like how you led the IBM research, but it's it's more like it was already established and you were trying to uh, expand it further. But in, in this particular case, Google was starting from scratch, starting from zero pretty much. So can you tell, tell us about your thought process for deciding to join or lead this particular group? And what kind of challenges you see as a, as a person who is trying to build things from scratch, but at the scale of, of course, uh, Google that uh, has a particular trademark of uh, doing research? Yeah. So first, a quick correction. I, I had uh, I prior to joining Google, I was running this startup, VideoCan. Uh, so right. in fact, VideoCan was a outcome of some work that we were doing at Xerox Research. So, I mean, there were a bunch of different research projects, uh, and when Xerox went through this transition, uh, many of us essentially licensed some initial uh, IP from Xerox that we had developed, our team had developed, and kind of launched different startups um, so uh, i mean one of those startups which is very successful right now is niramaya which is into breast cancer uh, screening using thermography applying ai to thermal right. uh, images yeah. yes. um, so i was leading video can where again we were applying ai to learning videos to again make them more easy to consume um, so and and more engaging so uh, so to me, I mean, initially it was kind of when uh, I was approached by Google initially, I mean, um, it wasn't an easy um, uh, decision because I kind of was quite focused on my startup and I wanted to ultimately make that uh, work. Uh, at some level, I then also recognized that, uh, I mean, I'm more of an accidental entrepreneur. Um, I realized that in the early stages of a startup, um, Probably there's, I mean, a much bigger need for the CEO, right, to be much more business driven rather than very technology oriented, uh, the way I was. So at some point, I felt that perhaps even video can would be better served um, by having a more business focused CEO. Um, and and what was attractive about this opportunity with Google was, uh, I mean, I have the sense that we are at this very unique moment in computing history, I would say. See, because I mean, uh, I'm this dinosaur, right? I mean, I was born in the year that Moore's law was proposed, right, 1965. And we've been on this journey, right? Uh, as a consequence of kind of what was predicted by Gordon Moore, the technology industry, right, has been working very hard to make his prediction come true, right? With this doubling of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, number of transistors, the number right, of trans the, yeah. the, the uh, capability, right? So the capability, the computational capability, right, of all these chips has advanced exponentially over the years in accordance with Moore's law. 
And I think what that has led to is, even though Moore's law is now slowing down considerably, what those like decades of exponential advances have done for the field is that from this very like a niche area, I mean, when I started my education in computer science, my BTEC in computer science at IIT Delhi, I mean, believe it or not, I'd never seen a computer at that time. Uh, I mean, <laughs> wow. Computers weren't, uh, weren't that uh, ubiquitous, right? And uh, the World Wide Web didn't exist, right? So, 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 so we have come such a long way. So I feel we are at this very, very opportune moment in computing history where computer science has gone from just like a field, or like a cool field, right, within engineering to becoming, in some sense, right, the dominant field, which is powering, right, so many aspects of how the world is run today. So, so I feel very fortunate that we are in this, that we computer scientists, right, are in this profession uh, that allows us to have impact on the real world. So I also feel we are at this moment that today we have so much of computational power available at our disposal uh, at a very low cost that if we are passionate about any problem, right, you pick any problem uh, kind of uh, that, that, the world is facing or your community is facing, I mean, at any end of the spectrum that you are passionate about, uh, I wouldn't say you can solve the problem, but you can, I mean, make a significant difference, right, to that problem with the help of computing. So, so to me, that is what is very exciting, that we are at this very interesting point uh, where we can make a real difference with the work that we do as computer scientists and, and being able to lead such a team right at Google Research, which is really again at the forefront of, of computing research and, and kind of and has this very, very progressive outlook, right? On 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 wanting to make a difference, right, uh, to the world. Um, I just found that to be ultimately a really compelling opportunity, right? To to hopefully make a difference. Uh, and I also see that as a responsibility, right, that we have ahead of us that we have to do justice to that opportunity through our work right yeah no i completely second that and um like like you also referenced this particular podcast that i had with dr tambe and before even before i had this uh, before he i think joined even google lab he was involved in a lot of projects that had kind of an impact and that was actually very very sub uh, like very surprising and nice um feel good moment for me where we where we actually see that okay these kind of tech, uh, technologies that we learn as a grad student or as a researcher or as a phd student that actually has some kind of impact that we can uh, achieve or at least aid certain other interdisciplinary sciences and that was something really really nice and i think that uh, seconds the idea that how you are trying to bring that particular ideology at Google Research Lab in India. So I really love that idea. And it's 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 correct. Like uh, the power that has increased, like in, it has enabled us to uh, at least create some applications that can create a difference. What we were doing before and how we can improve that or at least scale that to a majority population. So I, I, I really love that idea. Yes. But but in terms of your particular career, so you have been a researcher, you, you were a PhD student, you were a researcher over here at IBM, then you transitioned to a managerial role, entrepreneurial role, and now you are at a director level where you are leading efforts. In terms like for us as naive students who, don't, uh, who have not seen the field much enough or we don't have exposure, can you explain what are the differences between being a researcher, be it an academic student or working at some industry? And then being a senior researcher where you are leading efforts, they are basically uh, guidelining the whole project versus something like you, as in where you are actually managing multiple projects, you are worrying about the applications, you are worrying about how to hire people and which people to hire and whatnot. And also, also being at the junction of working with some industry, then people and also projects, like multiple, I think there are multiple modalities that you might be handling. So can you explain the differences? What are the differences as a person where you, when you are wearing these different hats? Right. <clears throat> so I would say, uh, I mean, first of all, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really amazing being a student. So in, in a way, I would also <laughs> say uh, being a student is one of the most enjoyable uh, parts of your life. Uh, I'm sure you relate to that. Um, because as a student, I think you, you can be very focused. I mean, when you're, let's say, pursuing a PhD, 
you're usually very focused on that particular PhD problem, right? That you're uh, trying to come up with innovative ways of solving that problem and better ways, more systematic, uh, very systematic and better ways of solving that problem than anybody else has, right? Previously. Right. Uh, and, and that is what you try to do as a student, especially as a PhD student. Uh, then when you <clears throat> go and start working, let's say in an industrial research organization, one of the things you have to do is you have to align your goals with the with the broader goals, right, of the organization and ideally also of the company. Because if you are able to align those goals, if you are working on something that your company cares about, something that your organization cares about, uh, you get that kind of amplifying uh, impact, right? I mean, you you get that uh, that force force uh, like that multiplying multiplicative factor, right, from the support that your organization provides. And one of the ways in which that organization provides that support is through collaborators. Uh, so again, I mean, mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough, right, to to right from early, like early in my career, I had this opportunity to work with kind of really stalwarts in the area. Uh, I mean, the senior manager of my team uh, at IBM Research was Fran Allen, who was the first woman to be an IBM fellow. She later became the first woman to win a Turing Award. And, and mm -hmm. there was this team of, again, amazingly kind of... Uh, uh, like the leaders, right, in their in their field, uh, in the area of I was doing research on compiling for parallel machines. Uh, so a, it was kind of amazing to be working alongside some of the leaders, which inspired you, right, to also be like them, right, to be amongst the best in the world in your field. So always, I mean, that goal uh, to me early in my career, the goal was that at least for the areas, right, that I'm working on, hopefully, right, I should aspire to be amongst the best researchers in the world. Uh, at least that was the driving, uh, kind of one of the driving factors and also achieve impact, right, on the organization's goals and on the company's goals. Uh, and as you kind of do further work, right, in an industrial research lab, you realize that you can have ultimately bigger impact if you can, uh, kind of combine your work right with those of others around you uh, and and if you can start to influence right the work of other researchers also and together you are able to achieve much bigger things right than you are able to do just by yourself just as an individual so i think a lot of then kind of some of that natural progression at an industrial research lab is where you're trying to to kind of provide greater levels of leadership. And, and I feel a lot of that comes from being able to figure out what are the right problems to solve, right? We often say in research, right? I mean, sometimes the hardest part is identifying the right problem right, to work on. Uh, then solving the problem right. sometimes is the easier part. Uh, I would say that's even more true, right? In an, let's say, industrial research setting, it is extremely important for you to, to figure out the right problems to solve. And if you're able to kind of uh, think ahead, right? And if you are able to pose the right kind of problems, right? That are worthy of being solved, where you as a team, right? Not just you as an individual, but also with others, you can together work on solving those problems, right? And make a difference to let's say your company's mission, to the world at large and so on, uh, it, it, it sets you up, right, for success. So I think right. there's, you start to have all of those kind of um, opportunities then for showing your leadership. And sometimes in the initial stages, you also, and sometimes even in later stages, you also have to learn to influence other people, even if you are not the manager. So, so, uh, one of the always kind of uh, goals you have is that look even I mean because what I say sometimes is which which I uh, encourage all of the young researchers that I work with is that especially early in your career you should not be too worried about all these labels I would say even later in your career but especially early in your career you should not be so hung up on these labels am I a team lead am I a manager and so on 
because in my view leadership shows up in the work that you do because if you are doing high quality work if you are proposing new ideas if you are coming up with new directions on where the team should be going and if you are able to convince the rest of your teammates that yes that's the right uh, direction right to to take you need not be the assigned leader right you are showing leadership through your actions uh, so so this is how i think young researchers and junior researchers can get started uh, start to show that impact and at some point right the organization re recognizes the leadership that you are showing and you you often are then appointed to those kind of positions and then you realize there's a lot more right to getting things done right rather than only the technical work because there is a great deal of work that you do in attracting the right kind of people in building the right kind of teams and ensuring right that different team members right are able to work harmoniously right together uh, in pursuit of a goal right that, that is larger than each of the individual goals right that we all have so so I, i think that kind of usually i would say progression often happens naturally um so yeah i mean that's been my journey yeah no i think this, these are very insight uh, useful insights as in because i can relate to few of them but again i'm a much much lesser experienced researcher but at least i can see the value where you pointed out few things is uh, the idea of working in like transitioning from being a researcher to identifying the problems right like which needs to be worked on and i think this is something i realized when i started my uh, my phd projects last year and i was actually confused when when a lot of senior researchers would tell me like which kind of projects we need really need to work on so me being a very naive researcher i would just jump on to the deep learning part right like programming or coding and everything stuff but when i presented those works at few conferences and people talk, approached me and asked more about the problems as in what kind of problem i'm trying to solve only then doing some homework i realized okay this this is actually efforts from a lot of people over the years where they identified which problems to work on as in like which which data sets to use which try, which try to which application we are trying to harmonize or which kind of uh, synthesis we want to do and that particular is the key idea or i would say the most mvp of a project me building a deep learning model was maybe the last thing people need in the research community because that's just the one fix one last point so i think i i see the value as in uh how people can progress being in the field and then understanding okay this is not solved this versus this is solved and what problems we can solve and that needs to be solved so i think yeah i i really love that idea so i can see the value uh, where you're pointing at so yeah yeah and um um uh, jumping back to the same uh, idea as in like the focus of google research lab in india and this is i i think this would be the uh, question that we can uh, transition to a different topic is i think a majority of the focus even when i talk to dr tambe is more on the explainability or robustness of ai models and also what you said this is much more application oriented as in not from a very uh, breadth of a topics perspective but more on the application oriented you pick out few problems and you want to solve them in a very uh, concrete sense so but from what i have heard and what i have uh, seen the industry publishing work the idea of interpretability explainability and robustness is very fairly new as in we we do understand what we want but we don't understand from a technical perspective so based on your experience leading this lab how would you in technical or non technical feel free to choose whichever but in which terms how would you define robustness as in what kind of idealistic perspective you can paint for people to at least grasp on and see okay this is what we want this is what the applications want that are not related to computer science but how if if we are going to use ai and we call them robust ai what they should look like at least in the next 5 or 10 years so what's your ideal definition you would give for robustness yeah so at least the lens that we apply in a lot of our work is uh, is how do you make these models robust to for instance shifts in data distribution right because as you know typically you start with training the models on certain training data that you have uh, and as you build these models and, and test them after you have tested them successfully you deploy them on the real world right now as you deploy them in the real world the data that they are encountering in the real world a it could be different from the kind of data that these models were trained on and b even if it is not different initially over a period of time right it could be different 
So I'll explain that with like maybe one, maybe I'll use a couple of examples, right, from yeah. some of the practical side uh, of what we are looking at. I mean, we are again motivated by the India context. Um, <clears throat> we see India has kind of now become the number two country. I mean, it's been for a while in terms of internet usage. And the way it became number two overtook the US in terms of number of people accessing the internet was primarily based on the usage of smartphones. Uh, so, so India has like over 600 million internet users uh, and most of them are accessing the internet not through desktop computers and so on, but through smartphones. Now, and many of these users, smartphone is the first such device. So these are new internet users. Smartphone is the first such device that they are digital device that they are using. So often we think about how would you make that device easier to use, more useful and so on, right? To, to these users. And one of the things that you would like to do is support things like maybe conversation, right? Uh, instead of me having to work through the various screens in Android and figuring out how to set certain settings, how to change certain settings and how to, uh, again, start a particular application and so on. It would be nice if I could simply issue a voice command and kind of have the phone do it. And furthermore, it would be nice if I can communicate with the phone in my native language rather than having to speak English. Uh, so now if you think about, let's say the ML models that you want to deploy on these phones, I think there are very interesting set of challenges. I mean, and one of them is on this robustness, right? That you just mentioned, because A, the kind of public data sets on which typically, let's say, automatic speech recognition or whatever, any NLP models and so on, right, are trained, are very different from the data, right, that you're going to encounter when you deploy them on these smartphones because the characteristics uh, and typical data pattern, right, for these users is very different from often like, uh, uh, data sets which are sourced from the West, from what goes on in the West and so on, right? So A, even the initial uh, kind of production data is often very different from the kind of standard data sets that often get used um, for training such models. And B, you're also going to see a lot of variability, like things in terms of, let's say, think in terms of, let's say, speech recognition, speech to text. There's going to be so much variation in the kind of accents that you're going to encounter. Um, so how do you uh, kind of support that? Uh, so that would be kind of one set of driving application. The other, I mean, as we think about also, I mean, things like robustness and explainability, you also think about some of the critical areas like health. Uh, when you apply AI to health related problems, uh, you don't want to make mistakes, right? I mean, uh, that are going to whatever, uh, lead to bad outcomes for people, right? Uh, I mean, it is fine, right, for an AI model to make a mistake when you're doing whatever, let's say, algorithmic trading or you're figuring out the right ad to show. Look, if instead of the right ad, I saw a different ad, it's not the end of the world. However, yeah. if the machine learning algorithm makes a different recommendation, right, let's say, in looks at my medical image, my chest x-ray and says, oh, you're fine, you don't, and I actually have, let's say, a serious issue, let's say there's some malignancy, the machine learning model says, no, 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 there's no such thing. I mean, that can be an extremely uh, harmful kind of a recommendation, and even though these are only recommendations to the doctors, but if the doctor is influenced uh, by the output of that machine learning algorithm and makes a bad decision, uh, it is going to cost right a lot. So so robustness becomes even more important right in 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 areas like health. So there, one of the lens we are taking is can we at least uh, calibrate these machine learning models, estimate the uncertainty of these deep learning models better? Can we at least, even if we can't make this algorithms work well on all kinds of data? 
can we at least have this algorithm recognize oh on this data i am not so confident about my prediction right because and and we know human humans do that all the time right human doctors when they see a complicated case a human doctor would say ah this is a complicated case let me consult another colleague and get a second opinion uh, and likewise i mean as students when we are given a tough uh, uh, exam i mean we know that we don't know the answer right to a tough question so we as humans know what we don't know but deep learning models often very confidently uh, give out the wrong prediction so can we at least train that model i mean can we at least kind of calibrate that model and have it convey that look i'm not so sure in this case so it's better for the human to make a decision completely disregarding what i'm telling um uh, the recommendation right that or prediction that i'm making uh, as an algorithm uh, for this case right so those are some of the different kind of lens through which we have looked at this problem of robustness and likewise explainability is the other thing that you mentioned uh, i mean again back to that medical imaging example you would ideally like the algorithm to also be able to explain its predictions why has it said that there is a case of malignancy can it also identify that region uh, where it believes there's that tumor uh, is malignant um, uh, or in case of let's say text kind of uh, uh, language related tasks uh, can you i mean when the system is is uh, recommending something or it is uh, kind of giving you a certain answer let's say you have a search query and when it when it answers uh, provides you a response can it also do attribution that look i'm saying whatever um, uh, let's say this covid vaccine is this particular safe because of here here are the sources here are the reliable sources right uh, 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 based on which right i am sharing this particular answer right so when you are answering a question can you also provide attribution um uh in in let's say an nlp task uh, those are all exp- i mean moving us towards greater explainability and i feel down the road they also will lead to more robust systems right because i mean you are more grounded uh, uh in 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 hopefully reality and truth that way right right so from from, from what i can take away from this is, is is making techniques that can hold these deep learning models or machine learning models accountable for whatever confidence intervals they are predicting or outputting as in even if they are uncertain please let us know how much uncertain you are or how much certain you are and possibly an explanation of why they are doing that so if if that would be a loose definition of robustness uh, i i think that that would be something really important and yeah yeah i i really like that and but i i think you mentioned a breadth of topics that have a lot of impact and i also again citing back to the podcast with dr tambe i wanted to learn more about like how do you decide which products do you work on as in you like i i i also come from india so i know i i know there is a variety of applications variety of uh, problems that can be solved because the like, problems are endless but in terms of ai applications we can either solve all of them or maybe none of them so how do you decide like which projects right. interests you versus which is possible versus that aligns with google research interests versus you have people who can actually make a difference working on those projects so how do you manage these multiple entry points and try to finalize a project that you might be working on for the next few years no that's actually a, an excellent question and and i think it's a very important one because uh, what i feel again having been also a graduate student and as i joined kind of industry in my early years i mean i can relate to what often goes on in the mind of a young researcher i mean uh, i remember when i graduated with a phd i mean i was very excited about that particular area and i wanted to solve further problems right in that area uh, and that's a very natural thing because and often this is how we as researchers choose problems we have certain area of expertise and and often our research interests are aligned with that expertise and sometimes what we do is we say oh 
we look at the available literature and we say, okay, existing state of the art is able to solve this problem. Let me pick a problem which is not adequately addressed, right, by the existing state of the art, which I believe I can solve, right? And therefore, I will be able to write a paper, right? I will be able to <laughs> claim, here's my advance, right, over the previous state of the art, and I'll, I'll be able to write a paper, everybody will be happy. So, so often, kind of, we have a tendency, right, to choose problems on that basis. What's that delta, right, to the existing state of the art, which I'm a interested in, which I'm reasonably confident I can solve, and and I I would say it is fine to be in that mode sometimes, but if that is your dominant mode, you are really missing out uh, on something much bigger, because because in my view the right way to pick problems is to do answer a series of so what questions, right? You say okay, uh, let's say uh, I say I want to solve this problem. So you should be asking me, so what? I mean, what would happen? I mean, if you were to solve that problem, then I give a response. And I think then you should ask another, so what question? Okay, I mean, yeah, I mean, I say, let's say I, I say, oh, I'll build multilingual models. So what? I mean, what will happen? Oh, this way, uh, I mean, that uh, uh, farmer's son that I was talking about, that laborer's daughter, she would also be able to, in some sense, access information in her native language. You ask another, so what? And then you, I give another response based on that saying, look, this is going to now make so much of a difference, right? It could improve whatever this girl's learning ability. She could now become much more successful in her career. And so, so after a series of these, so what questions, if you end up with answers that suggest that the impact is going to be significant. In my view, that's a worth problem. That's a problem worth solving. Because mm -hmm. if after a series of so what, you end up with something which, yes, I mean, maybe improves things a little bit by a, by a small degree for a small set of people and so on, perhaps the problem is not worth uh, going after, right? I mean, it's, I mean, Maybe it's, I mean, I'm not making a judgment call, it's not worth solving, but I mean, with your limited time, with your finite amount of time that you have, right? Perhaps uh, in your lifetime and so on, perhaps you should be focused on bigger problems. So now, now a problem with some of these bigger problems is, you realize, look, I don't have the skills, right? I don't have the ability to solve that bigger problem by myself. So A, it, puts you now, in some sense, it takes you out of your comfort zone uh, uh, when you pick these larger problems. Uh, and one of the things that you have to do is not just solve the problem, try to solve the problem alone. You have to now team up with other people and often team up with people who bring, who have complementary expertise to what you have. Because sometimes also we have this very tendency, right, that, oh, uh, I work on natural language processing or I work on computer vision. Let me work with other researchers also in computer vision. And yes, we kind of advance, right? The state of the art. And also that is how we often structure even teams. Right? I mean, we have people with computer vision expertise all working together and so on. I think every once in a while, you should also be looking at, okay, here's this big problem that I want to solve, which is going to require expertise, not just in computer vision, it will require natural language processing, it will under require HCI expertise, it would require some social science kind of a uh, 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 background, maybe some economics, ideas from economics, and maybe, uh, uh, I mean, uh, likewise, when I'm looking at the world of healthcare, maybe it requires some medical kind of domain expertise and so on. So when you're solving these bigger problems, A, you really need to start to bring together, right? And start collaborating with people uh, who bring complementary expertise to you to what you have, and and I would say it's it's often right in your career you should be working on such more ambitious problems uh, because of two reasons right one is that your rate of learning is much higher when you work on these challenging problems outside your immediate comfort zone uh, because you're learning so many new things. Uh, 
yeah. often right from your teammates who bring that complementary expertise. So even if you fail at that at that uh, project, right, in that project at solving that problem, you have still learned a lot, right? So even if you fail, sometimes it's, I mean, often it is worth it to work on those challenging problems because you are learning so much and, and many of these failures, right, are paving the way for bigger success down the road. And the other aspect is that if you succeed even once or twice, the both the, the recognition that you get from the community, which is what often researchers crave for, but more importantly, ultimately, it's also the sense of self-satisfaction. Your own sense of self-satisfaction is going to be much higher when you solve, when you come up with good solutions to a meaningful problem than when you only do some incremental work and yes, you've got that paper published and, and when you look back upon your career and you say, oh, I've written all these hundred papers, uh, if those are all incremental papers, I can assure you, you're not going to get that same sense of satisfaction as you would get, even if you have solved, let's say, two problems, forget two problems, even if you have solved one problem that really made a, made a big difference right, to the world, uh, you're going to feel much greater sense of satisfaction. Uh, and of course, I would also say, I encourage the young researchers to take a longer term view. Now also, I mean, even for, I mean, honestly, we are all also motivated often by the recognition, fame and so on. I mean, if you look at kind of uh, people getting major awards, right? When people get major awards, let's say like Nobel prizes and other fields, Turing award in the area of computing, they get, they get these major awards, right? Usually, for one defining accomplishment, right? Or a very small set of major accomplishments, right? Nobody gets a major award, oh, because they've written 500 papers that have 500,000 citations. Nobody gets a major award for, for just producing a body of work. People get major recognition for making really like outstanding contributions to a few major problems. And I would say even you get a lot more satisfaction out of that. Which is why, I, and, and often that doesn't come naturally to us. Uh, the natural tendency often is to work on those incremental kind of problems, uh, which is why I think that this is very, very important um, and something to be very, very deliberate about uh, uh, when, when you are pursuing a research career. I, I love this perspective and I'm like, I'm, there's nothing much I can add as in because I'm, I think I'm, I'm still in that uh, very minimalistic uh, short view. But I think from what I understand is like, it's important to zoom out a bit and see what, what kind of impacts we can do. And if the impact is very less, then maybe it's not worth solving or maybe we can have a lesser uh, bandwidth to that particular project. But it's important to zoom out and see what is the bigger charter, charter that we can address and start working on that? Because it's like, even if you're working on big project, if it doesn't happen to be the best thing, but at least you did something better than the, uh, the smaller impacts that you have. So I, I, I really love that thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, th th this is something I realize, um, can only come from senior people because we as students, we don't have the breadth of exposure uh, for the entire field, let, let alone computer vision or AI, which is like rapidly developing. So I think this is very important from uh, for us to hear that, okay, please zoom out and work. No, on, I want to, I want to, no, I want to correct you over there. I mean, not, I, I shouldn't say use the word correct you, but I mean, I beg to differ because sometimes I feel younger people are capable of much bigger things than <laughs> older people like me uh, and most of the time I would say see because when you are a junior researcher and so on right um, one of the things one of the strengths you have is you're not burdened by conventional wisdom because one of the things that often affects as you kind of get entrenched in a given field um, while on one hand you kind of gain that experience all those insights and so on uh, one of the things that happens is you start, I mean, you, you get too embedded in the conventional way of thinking about it, right? Yeah. Because you've been thinking about that problem for years 
and you are talking to these other researchers who are also thinking about these problems for years and so on, right? So sometimes it makes your perspective a bit stale. And the power of young researchers is you don't have that problem of <laughs> yeah. being burdened by conventional wisdom, right? So often uh, you guys who are young, you have some big advantages over people like me, right? Who are more senior, more experienced and so on, right? So, which is why I wanted to challenge you that don't think that oh, you have to, whatever, have those years of experience and so on, right? Before you will really be able to accomplish those big things. No, often young researchers achieve breakthroughs uh, that elude uh, experienced people. And in fact, there is that theory, right? There is that, uh, try to remember what was that book, Medici Effect, which had that uh, kind of a claim that most breakthroughs right, in the history, um, uh, in our human history, have come from either very young people or people who were new to a field. Uh, mm. That they may have been experienced, but they were new to a field. And the reason they were able to come up with those breakthroughs is because they weren't burdened by conventional wisdom. So I don't want to get into the debate. Look, there are plenty of also breakthroughs that have come from very experienced uh, researchers, uh, so I don't want to minimize that, but there is that line of thought, right, which yeah. uh, which has a certain merit to it, and so don't underestimate your own capability, right, as a young researcher, and so don't be afraid to dream big uh, and achieve those those big things. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice way to put it like that. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. I agree. And and one other question I I think uh, specific to India that I want to cover uh, to the last is um, the idea we talked about how we are we are working on challenges that are specific to India. But I want to learn like, have you had uh, 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 particular encounters for challenges that are specific to India? Because you're when you're working on these projects which are specific originating from India, what kind of challenges that have you seen? Uh, that are uh, imposing uh, and how, how, how are you trying to solve those challenges? Because I realize when you're working on these kind of unsolved problems, there is no textbook, right? So you, you might be facing in terms of data collections, working with people, working with collaborators who are not from computer science domain. And this would be specific to India because the way uh, how that they are organized over there in India. So what kind of challenges have you seen are the most common ones? And what would you have any tips on those kind of challenges for other people who are not affiliated with Google, but who want to do something similar, they can actually replicate from your insights? Yeah, so see, I mean, when we pick problems, let's say, and examples being, let's say, we are looking at this problem of uh, access to information in Indian languages, uh, or when we look at kind of some of these problems, right, uh, that these nonprofit organizations, right, uh, our partners in that AI for Social Good program uh, have raised, uh, a very common theme to many of these kind of some of the challenges uh, that appear in the scenario is often you don't have enough resources, right? So because again, machine learning, typically, right? Models thrive on a lot of labeled data being available, right? So whenever you have lots of labeled data available, um, it becomes much easier, right? For you to build, yeah. uh, again, amazing models. Uh, so, so often one kind of a common challenge is you don't have I mean, the amount of labor data that you have available, let's say for Gujarati, uh, if I'm trying to do uh, speech to text for Gujarati, is much, much lower, right, than what I have available for English. Uh, and, and therefore, again, uh, my levels of accuracy, or if I'm trying to translate Gujarati text into English, uh, because of the overall corpus of text that I have access to uh, is much lower, uh, I'm going to face that challenge, right? So one is, uh, often resources. Another big challenge often that we find in India is the scale, because anything to do with number of people, you find, I mean, you need to solve that problem uh, for hundreds of millions of people. Uh, another common thread is often like resource uh, is also even hardware resources. So I give that example of working on smartphone, low cost smartphones. So when you look at low-end smartphones, I mean, the amount of computational power that they have is much lower than 
the high-end smartphones because high-end smartphones now now these pixel phones right they are begin they are coming with even these tpu chips tpu based accelerators yeah. which can dramatically kind of improve the performance of machine learning workloads so when you don't have as much of computational power as much of memory and so on right so low resource uh, so so low resource sometimes in terms of data sometimes in terms of the hardware resources that you have available uh, much bigger challenge often the data tends to be very noisy um, you don't have clean data available uh, sometimes you don't have data available in electronic form to begin with right so i mean if we look at for instance healthcare data a lot of healthcare data in india is in these handwritten prescriptions by by doctors uh, it is not in electronic health records so how do you start with that kind of a data right and put it into elect- digital form so that your machine learning <laughs> algorithm right can even uh, start to do something about that data so you find a lot of these challenges and i would say uh, not ev- i mean i rarely have encountered something which was only specific to india right because typically the the nice thing is when you work on some of these challenges and if you solve these problems in a principled manner often you can come up with solutions that are going to be useful not just in india but would be relevant right also for many parts of the world beyond india uh because if nothing else you will find maybe many parts of africa uh many other parts of latin america and so on right where you're dealing with very similar challenges of let's say uh, not enough resources being available or not enough digital resources uh data in digital form and so on available um and there are there are other challenges where i feel if you innovate uh motivated by the indian context you are going to do something which is relevant for the entire world so if i look at healthcare uh my view is the future the real action in healthcare in the future is going to be outside the formal healthcare system right outside the hospitals uh because often when we think about healthcare we think about the doctor's office we think about the hospital and so on and and as one of my colleagues once said those are not those are really sick care systems and the future of healthcare is in true healthcare where you are working with healthy people and you are trying to keep them healthy so and there's so much of a burden of disease today right which is from lifestyle diseases and so on so my view is the real action a lot of the real action in healthcare in the future is going to be before you get to the hospital right when you are living your normal life at home and at work and so on right and we are seeing that future already right we are seeing all these uh, wearables through which so much of our body vitals data can be collected there are mobile phones there are all these apps i can now point uh, the mobile phone to my face and it can uh, uncover my respiration rate and my heart rate and all kinds of uh, parameters right body vitals so so uh so there is so a country like india which doesn't have a very well developed formal healthcare system we don't have too many hospitals we don't have uh even too many primary healthcare centers which are staffed with medical doctors uh so i'm not suggesting that those are not important of course india needs to make progress in terms of building more hospitals having more doctors available for the for our population for our needs and so on but i'm saying there's an even bigger need in a country like india to build those to have that focus on preventive health on on wellness so that you reduce the pressure on this formal healthcare system mm-hmm. and we have seen kind of that uh, illustrated so much right with the in the pandemic because everybody recognizes right that it's far better to try and avoid getting covid rather than yeah. then getting yourself treated uh, once you have covid right so there's that saving prevention is better than cure so 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 that is the future of uh, of kind of health so i believe there are many such areas where even if you are initially motivated by the unique challenge or whatever unique sounding challenge in india uh, you will end up hopefully doing work which is relevant to the rest of the world too 
uh, and 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 many of these problems when we think about like low resources um, uh, and kind of large scale and so on they push you towards towards novel ways of solving those problems right which can be meaningful research contributions right uh, in their own right yeah. uh, so so it's 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 often kind of a very uh, kind of a worthwhile uh, and satisfying thing right to be able to 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 work on problems that are motivated by the indian context because often that is allowing you to do work right which is uh, kind of world class yeah no i really love that as in like you're trying to build and focus more on digital solutions that can prevent these things before happening and that can eventually have a cascading effect on improving the healthcare systems and 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 i also like that because i think when i talked to dr tambi he also mentioned that actually working on these challenges from only the challenge perspective also inspires a lot of creativity from the foundational perspective how we can develop models specific to that and like you said those models can be used in different contexts not even just for healthcare in india but they can be used for a very different problem but nobody had thought of if uh, thought of that particular problem in that sense so yeah, yeah I, I i think yeah challenges do inspire the mm-hmm. foundational perspective of uh, computer science research overall so yeah yeah i i, I love that and uh, i all one, one one other question in concrete terms i have is these kind of projects when you work and like you said uh, as we start off as a young researcher the only focus is trying to beat the state of art right like trying to even like even just like a 5% of increase is kind of a big deal and we try to celebrate that but in these kind of projects when you are working on much more subjective definitions right you are working with people on real world scenarios where people are getting affected or i think uh, wildlife and a lot of other problems which do not have a clear mapping in terms of performances how do you define or how do you understand the metrics when you are working on these projects that hey this project is doing good versus this is doing moderate or actually this is making things worse how do you define in terms of numbers we know how we can do it there are tons of uh, mathematical formulas we can do that but in this case i think it it has to be a subject basis uh, scenarios you work you you have to factor in for a lot of informations how do you typically on an average uh, define metrics for success yeah. and of the so products? typically i mean what you do is at a very high level you try to have metrics more in terms of so for instance when i look at it at, at a lab level uh, i have a particular metric that through our work we want to impact over a billion lives uh, in a positive manner right uh, on the planet so so that's a very high level uh in some sense goal and a metric uh but when you work on then specific problems uh then you try to boil it down into more measurable things that you can do so for instance uh back to melon's work uh as part of the af for social good with one of the non profits arman that we have been working with uh so melon and his team they have kind of now done randomized controlled trials with tens of thousands of people right and shown that yes shown in a very rigorous manner that yes you the level of engagement you are having with the expecting mothers and the outcomes uh, that you are going to achieve uh, for those expecting mothers is going to be better as a result of your algorithm right your let's say uh, restless multi armed bandits based algorithm which is being used to identify which women should receive a call from a human uh, volunteer uh, uh, that it is actually leading to greater level of engagement so uh, it is lowering the dropout uh, of women from that program and and in fact it is ultimately leading to better health outcome right for these for these people uh, so yes i mean when we get down to specific projects then we try to come up with more concrete measurable metrics uh, uh, so that you are able to uh, i mean at least stay true to yourself that yes you have actually uh, uh, made a positive difference yeah 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 i i i love that i love that and 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 uh, switching switching the gears a little bit uh, i i want to switch to the idea of you being as a researcher now we can like 
putting away the Google uh, hat over uh, for a minute is I want to learn more about your thoughts as a young researcher versus a senior researcher. So you you moved back to India after a long streak of career that you had at IBM, right? And like you said, you 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 had different transitions of being a PhD student then a researcher senior researcher and then a manager at IBM where you worked on the uh, a very big project, I think Eugene supercomputer project. So what was your uh, thought process? Because on a majority, if we see the majority people who stay over here in the United States or basically anywhere out of India, they typically tend to stay over there, that particular location. But you, you tried to move back, you had a lot of other thoughts. So I want to learn what factors did you personally consider for moving back to India and what factors motivated you to go back into the first place? Yeah, so one of the motivating factors was always to make a real difference. Um, and and, uh, and I remember being very like uh, influenced by when I was uh, an undergraduate student at uh, IT Delhi, I remember once there was a speaker uh, who had made a similar transition, who had moved from the US to India. And that speaker made this very interesting statement. He said, in the US, I was operating at this high level and kind of, uh, uh, and after returning to India, kind of again in the, maybe because of whatever resource constraints and so on, those were also very different days. Uh, he said, okay, I'm operating at a lower level, right? In terms of technology. Uh, or whatever, lower level, maybe in terms of absolute output, in terms of my research output. But he said, if I look at kind of the impact I was having, right, on the world uh, through my work in the US, right, I would make maybe this delta impact, whereas in India, through my work, I can have much bigger, I can have much bigger impact, right? So he said, your sense of satisfaction is actually driven right more by the delta that you are able to create rather than the absolute kind of level of your output uh, so even if the absolute level of output uh, perhaps had been higher in the us because i'm able to make a bigger difference uh, in india uh, i find it more satisfying to be back in india right so so I, I, I mean, I was for a long time influenced by 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 those words, right? That I uh, that I heard, and I literally, I mean, I I I experienced that uh, after uh, moving to India because I feel that in a lot of different ways, right? So as we were contributing and so on, uh, I felt there was much bigger opportunity to make a difference through the real world around me. Um, through the work that we uh, that we were doing, uh, so that has been a very satisfying part of being back in India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can see the uh, the value this comes from. So yeah, I I definitely uh, like that, and I hope I hope people people actually consider this particular perspective that you had back in mind and consider doing that. I think yeah, that's that's really that's really really important. And um, in terms of learning more about the learning more for the students, so you you mentioned a lot of quite different things. I think zooming out and focusing on impact that that could have long term benefits, which which is a nice perspective for even young researchers or senior researchers to have. What kind of other skills you would tell, or maybe a young researcher who is trying to maybe make uh, make her his or her career in, into academia or industry that are typically not a part of the textbook, or that that is not typically being learned very straight away but people learn over the time what kind of skills apart from being technical expert being technical expert at something what skills would you say you look for researchers ideally that hey this is something i learned uh, in my long time career but this is something one should always learn apart from being great at what they are doing that helps in the collaboration process or working in teams or something like that any kind of skills that are not part of the text i would say yeah i mean i, I mean one is i think being curious being 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 very driven being very motivated by something bigger than your own personal cause uh, uh, i i think and and always being willing to learn more because the world keeps changing that technology keeps advancing right so uh, just because you are an expert at something uh, is not going to serve you right for too long 
unless you keep learning new new okay. stuff right so so i think that part about again always i mean being uh, willing to learn uh, and and willing to go out of your comfort zone uh, stretching yourself right to go after these bigger goals and so on i mean that i would say would be kind of one key thing apart from of course kind of uh, building that expertise and and building that expertise often i mean people talk about this t shaped individual concept that you should have good breadth uh, just like that top part of t but also depth uh, at least there should be one area where you really uh, have much greater level of expertise than anybody else in the world uh, even if that is a very narrow area so it is good to combine that breadth and depth uh, 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 as you kind of uh, build up your expertise yeah 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 this is useful yeah definitely and well, one last question i have before before we try to wrap up is uh, as you mentioned you you pretty much started at a at a stage where we didn't see much more of an ai based whole hype where we didn't have a lot of technologies which were solely relying or maybe majorly relying on ai technologies but with the transition of new hardware lots of uh, improvisations we now have ai technologies which can be pretty much developed and used by a lot of app, like a lot of naive researchers or maybe naive people who are not even into the computer science domain so you saw a transition into how ai came into place and how it will look like in the next few years i see there is always a concern where people are concerned who are not from technical perspective about the idea of automations that hey ai is going to automate a lot of stuff a lot of jobs are going to replace or maybe diminished by these kind of technologies and you are also working with a lot of collaborators who are not from computer science domain they don't necessarily understand how these statistical algorithms or mathematical models work so do you have any comment on that particular concern that people or we we always see in this new news media articles right like clickbaity articles where they try to point out that hey uh, ai based tools are taking away the jobs for radiologists or something like uh, menial jobs that people have uh, that can be replaced using these statistical algorithms so can you can you comment like can you comment in in your sense when you have seen the whole uh, shift from how ai have was at zero versus how it's now currently and you are working on different inter interdisciplinary collaborators can you comment like how much do you think the balance lies where do you think would be the ideal scenario yeah so i think one of the things i think there is a need for us as computer scientists as ai researchers and so on right to take a more holistic perspective uh, and and look for ways in which we develop ai technologies and we kind of develop solutions in a manner that is augmenting human capacity rather than trying to replace humans right so so i think it is much more important as we are developing these tools in health uh, in let's say you are looking at learning and so on right i mean the more you can think about how do you ultimately help uh, doctors make good decisions you help the teachers become more effective you help again the learners uh, learn more so i think it is also very important for us as ai researchers and practitioners to to approach these problems in a more responsible manner um, and at the same time i would also say that i mean as you look at the whole era of industrialization and so on right it has always led to changes right where there are certain kinds of jobs that start becoming less relevant uh, but in place of those jobs right there are newer jobs that emerge and hopefully you are creating greater opportunities for again humans to do higher level more meaningful uh, uh, kinds of work uh, so that even if some of those other jobs start to become start to go away or become less relevant and so on right you are providing uh, but i think i think ultimately there has to be the right balance because i do not believe it is right for us as computer scientists to say oh how i'm my job is to develop technology how that technology gets used whether for good or bad that's not my problem uh, 
I don't think that's the attitude that we should be taking. We should be looking at ourselves ultimately as, again, responsible citizens uh, and, and, and we should ourselves be thinking about the implications, the societal implications and so on, right? The human implications of the work that we are doing and do our work in a manner, right? That we are ultimately helping humans um, uh, uh, overall, right? Rather than trying to simply whatever, uh, take jobs away from humans and so on, or trying to simply like, let's say, add to the bottom line of, of the company uh, of your organization and so on, right? At the expense of, 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 uh, of kind of quality of human life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something I really, I, this is something I really like, and this is uh, gonna stay at least for me a lot. So yeah, yeah, I, I really love this perspective, and I think yeah, I mean overall, like this particular podcast, I covered a lot of topics, and this is frankly a, a lot of good insights that I learned because I think we we covered from a lot of uh, different topics, being from a naive researcher to senior researcher to management talking about the futures and how we can address these challenges uh, at a bigger scale like India and India is one of the biggest uh, population diversity that we find on this planet so I mean this is something this is something uh, a lot to take in so yeah this is something very useful I find and I'm, I'm gonna bookmark a lot of points that you covered that at least uh, I, I really like the idea of particularly zooming out as in something I have been realizing a lot for myself, which I really love. And I, I love your insights on that particular thing. But apart from that, uh, I, I, I don't have any more questions for you. And I think we are fairly slightly out of time. So I'll, 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 I'll just thank you and I'll, I'll, I'll leave a link to most of your works and I think a uh, homepage that you have so that people who want to learn more about uh, these projects or maybe follow you in terms of what projects are works that you are publishing out so that they can keep tuned to it but apart from that i i really thank you i i really thank you i think it's a it's a bad timing for like at, at least the time zones that we have so i i really appreciate you doing at the at a very uh oddly hour so i i really thank you for doing this and um i hope people who are listening or tuning into this podcast find this useful so thanks thanks once again for doing this podcast Thanks, thanks again, uh, Jay. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and I, I hope this was of interest, uh, of some use to you, uh, as well as the other uh, uh, people who are listening to this. Thank you.